for the introduction and thanks for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, so I want to give you some background. A couple of years ago, um, I was reading an article of Pally Jorgensen, which is um, given below. And um, in this article, one of the main results was a result of a, a fixed point result about projection value measures and iterated function systems. So I've copied and pasted it here. And P is a projection value measure. And the fixed point result is um, evident in part D, which I'll just uh, zoom in on. Um, so the fixed point relation is right here, and um, this should look sort of vaguely familiar to the Hutchinson measure fixed point result, but this is a functional analytic generalization of it. So um, reading this article sort of sparked an interest for me in continuing to study operator value measures um, associated to IFSs, and that's going to be the main topic of this talk. And then if I have time at the end, I want to talk a little bit about multifunctions um, building off the work of Franklin and his colleagues um, in a paper a few years ago. Um, so that's the plan for today. Um, so to begin, um, let n be a natural number and look at this at gamma sub n. Then we can consider the countable product of gamma sub n, which I'm going to call omega. And um, this was highlighted yesterday. Um, so uh, if we put the discrete topology on gamma sub n, omega is compact. And um, in fact, this topology is induced, um, for instance, by the D1 half metric, so um, <coughs> which is the distance between two um, elements is just going to be 1 over 2 to the i, where i is the first index where those, where those um, entries, where, the, uh, where those two elements differ. Um, and then on this space, we can define shift maps, which I'm going to call eta sub i, going from omega to omega, which just puts an i <coughs> in, in, the first, in the first entry. And um, these shift maps are themselves Lipschitz contractions um, with respect to that metric. And th um, this family of maps comprises an IFS on omega. And omega is actually the unique fixed fractal set associated to this IFS. Um, now, um, the Hutchinson measure for this particular IFS, and they're called nu, and um, it's also referred to as the Bernoulli measure, and it, um, it's the unique Borel probability measure which satisfies this um, middle relation here. And um, just to get a feel for this, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this, but um, this measure nu measures the cylinder sets, say um, A1 cross dot 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 AK across the rest omega as, as one, over, um, a, 1 over n to the k. Now, um, next I want to look at um, just an arbitrary IFS, which I'm going to call sigma 0 through sigma n minus 1, so the same number of elements, on a compact metric space. So I'm cutting to the chase here and saying that xd is the fractal set, um, so it's the compact metric space. And so, in other words, x equals this union of sigma i of x. I mean, you can start with your ambient metric space, then you're going to restrict to your attractor set eventually. So I'm just doing that to start off with. Um, and then um, the Hutchinson measure on x associated to s, I'm going I'm to call mu. Any questions so far? OK. Um, so now I want to describe the coding map, which was also mentioned yesterday. So if you take uh, an element in omega, you can map it to an element of x. Um, I'm going to call that pi alpha, which is the intersection from n equals 1 to infinity of sigma alpha 1 composed of sigma alpha n of x. And since these sigma i's are all contractive, um, pi alpha is a singleton in x. And we're going to call this map pi from omega to x, the coding map, which, which was mentioned yesterday. And, um, this is a lemma due to Jorgensen. I'm sure it comes up in other places as, as well. But this coding map is continuous and therefore measurable, and moreover satisfies um, this middle relation. So if you shift and then project, that's the same thing as projecting and then applying the appropriate sigma i. So this leads to the proposition on the next slide, which is that nu and mu are related via the coding map. We've got nu of pi inverse is equal to mu. Um, and uh, 
the main goal of this talk is to try to generalize relation one to the functional analytic setting. So, in other words, what we're going to do by the end of the talk is um, obtain this relation v star e of pi inverse v equals a, where e and a are operator valued measures, and v is a bounded operator from L2 of x mu to L2 of omega nu. And I think v could, is actually an isometry and um, could be, have to think about it, but could be the same as what Andrew Vince was talking about in yesterday's talk at the end. So it could make another appearance today. Um, so anyway, for a proof of this theorem, it just uh, follows from the uniqueness of nu and mu. So if we look at this first summation, we can use that lemma to interchange pi inverse of sigma I inverse with eta i inverse pi inverse, and then by the uniqueness of nu, that has to equal nu of pi inverse. But mu is the unique Borel probability measure satisfying this relation, and since nu pi inverse also satisfies it, they have to actually be the same. So um, following the work of Jorgensen, we're going to um, define bounded operators on L2 of omega nu. Uh, which I'm going to call T sub i, which, so T, T sub i maps phi to square root n, phi composed with eta, the indicator function on eta i of omega, where eta, I, eta is just sort of the backward shift. You just remove the first entry. Um, and then the associated adjoints for, for T sub i are given by this formula below, 1 over root n, phi composed with eta i. And Jorgensen showed that, in fact, these operators are isometries. And moreover, um, these maps satisfy the Kuntz relation. And that's that the sum of ti ti star equals the identity operator on L2 of omega, and that ti star tj equals delta ij times the identity operator, where delta ij is 1 if i equals j and 0 if they differ. So in other words, um, we have that this Hilbert space admits a representation of the Kuhn's algebra. Um, now, he also showed that there's a unique projection value measure E defined on the Borel subsets of omega, taking values in the projections on L2, satisfying the first, th those, two, um, those two properties. The first one is a generalization of the Hutchinson fixed point. Um, uh, equation and the second one just tells you how E behaves on nice subsets. So, um, just uh, incidentally, this theorem is more general. So, it, it would apply to um, a non-overlapping injective IFS as well. But this is but this omega space is an example of a disjoint and injective IFS. So we can apply this theorem. And um, in the work of my thesis, I sort of came up with an alternative proof of this Jorgensen theorem by looking at the sum there, one, as actually a map on an appropriate complete metric space of projection value measures. Um, the way Jorgensen proved this result was sort of um, looking at, looking at um, property two and then extending that to an pro actual projection value measure, which then satisfied one. So, the, the work in my thesis sort of um, motivated this follow-up work related to these positive operator value measures using a similar kind of approach of a, a Lipschitz contraction. Um, so um, that's the projection value measure that, that shows up in this, in this formula. Now I want to talk about finding this positive operator value measure. So um, are there any questions? Okay, so similar to above, um, now we're going to work on L2 of x mu. Um, we can define f sub i to be phi, uh, 1 over root n, phi composed with sigma i. This was essentially the adjoint formula ti star, but now I'm doing it in L2 of x mu. And just for notational sake, to make it look similar to before, I'm just going to put si to be the adjoint of f i. So let's just see, for example, why fi is a bounded operator. So if we take um, an element phi in L2, then just using the properties of the Hutchinson measure, we can get that this summation of integrals is actually the L2 norm squared. Um, and then using this observation, if we look at the L2 norm squared of fi of phi, 
using the formula <laughs> for f by of t, um, we get this middle e this we get this middle equality, and then we're going to add to it a bunch more positive terms, and then this turns out to be um, the L2 norm uh, squared of phi. So then this is just a bounded operator with an operator norm less than or equal to one. Um, and in Jorgensen's 07 paper, which um, was the harmonic analysis of iterated function systems with overlap, he showed that these FI operators, which I'm going to rename as SI, um, satisfy the first property of the Kuntz relations, regardless of if they have overlap or not. Um, and um, you can get, so the idea here is that you can still get some, with just this one relation here, you, you lose this projection value um, uh, property. <coughs> but you can still get mileage just from property one. Um, so to see this, uh, for a proof of this result, so if we look at this sum of SI, SI star, it's a self adjoint operator. So we can just, all we need to show is show that it equals phi inner product with phi. So if we write out what this is in terms of the FIs, and then um, set about, take out the sum, move the, use adjoint properties, and then use just the computation of what this inner product is, we end up getting phi dot phi. So in other words, this is just the identity operator in, in the Hilbert space. So um, I just mentioned that Jorgensen and, and his colleagues, Terry Cornelson, who's at University of Oklahoma now, and Karen Schumann, who I think is at Grinnell College, um, showed that this family of operators satisfies both properties of Kuntz relations when the IFS has non-essential overlap. Um, and you have to make an additional assumption on the IFS that they're um, injective, or at least maybe a, he has maybe a slightly more general version of being injective. But um, uh, anyway, so that, that, uh, that's an interesting result, but we want to just focus on property one right now. Um, so now, uh, this metric came up in my thesis when I was looking at projection value measures, so um, you can extend it to positive operator value measures. I think this is not doing enough time. Okay, so um, let's let S of X be the collection of positive operator value measures from the Borel subsets of X to the positive operators on H, where I'm going to call H the L2 of X mu. And we can define a metric on S of X, which is exactly just the supremum over all the one functions of the operator norm of the integral of FDA minus the integral of FDB. So you can integrate with respect to these operator value measures. And this is exactly the Kantorovich metric, but you slap on operator norms rather than just absolute values. And the Lip 1 functions are real value Lipschitz 1 functions with Lipschitz constant less than or equal to 1. Uh, so this turns out to be a metric. Um, it's a complete metric space. It's bounded. Um, the one difference from the classical setting is it's not compact. Um, but you know, for our purposes, we really only need complete completeness to, to apply the contraction mapping theorem. And moreover, this map, just like it is in the classical setting, this B mapping to this sum, it's a Lipschitz contraction in the in the row metric. Um, with Lipschitz constant equal to the maximum of the Lipschitz constants of each of the members of the IFS. And so as a corollary, there is a unique positive operator value measure A satisfying um, this equality right here. And this is a generalization of the Hutchinson measure. So um, to see why that's true, if you take the one element in L2 of X mu, um, we can consider the scalar measure associated to that, which is just a dot applied to one inner product of one. Uh, and we'll show that that's actually equal to mu. So if you look at a11 dot, that's going to be equal to just plugging in a, the summation for a, and then pulling out the sum, moving the si over, applying the formula to, to the one element, factoring out the the one over root n's, and 
realizing that this is exactly what mu must satisfy. So in fact, mu is just A11. Um, so now I want to talk about uh, this formula that I this generalized formula. So Jorgensen, at the end of his paper, um, defines this operator V, which connects L2 of X mu with L2 of omega nu. And the map is just F gets sent to F composed of pi. Um, and this is, in fact, an isometry. But what we really need is, is, the, is the second identity here, um, which is that V fi equals Ti star of V. Um, and that's the key relation that will allow us to prove the next result. So um, I did a proof of this, which I'm going to skip, but it just goes through the details of that um, relationship. And so now what I want to do is consider the projection value measure E of pi inverse from the Borel subsets of X to the projections on L2. And um, the theorem is that E pi inverse and the positive operator value measure A are related in the following way. Um, and uh, this theorem generalizes the new pi inverse equals mu to a more functional analytic setting. And in fact, you can think of um, E of pi inverse really as a dilation of the positive operator value measure A in the sense of the famous Nymark's dilation theorem. So every positive operator value measure A can be dilated to this projection value measure on the on the sort of infinite string space um, up to this coding map. And so for a proof of the theorem, well, if we just define L to be this quantity here, we want to show that L equals A. Um, and we'll use those two, um, those two formulas there. So, well, we put it into this summation formula, put in what A is, uh, then use this these properties here to switch these orders. Um, also switch these guys from uh, to eta i inverse pi inverse. Pull out the v's, and then by the uniqueness of e, e has to be just e pi inverse, which is just l. And since a also has to satisfy that if it's unique, l has to actually be equal to a. Um, so that's the the end of the sort of main. Uh, the fir main first part of my talk, which is that we have this dilation formula. And um, I'll spend a couple minutes talking about multifunctions, which is, a, which is a little bit of a switch gears, but it is related to Franklin's work, so I thought it would be interesting to talk about. Um, so uh, I want to talk about multifunctions and IFSs. So uh, I'll recall for you what a multifunction is in the definition of Franklin's paper. So. If we let K be the collection of all compact subsets of, um, of X, this collection K can be equipped with a Hausdorff metric, which you're probably familiar with. Um, it turns it into a complete metric space. So here, I guess we're just taking K to be, you know, some complete metric, or X to be some complete metric space. And then um, if you take, let t be a set, a multifunction with respect to t and x is a set value function from t to the compact subset. So for every little t in t, you associate a um, compact subset of x. And then we're going to take the convention that the empty set gets sent to x. Um, and Franklin and his colleagues showed that this metric space of multifunctions is complete when you put this d infinity metric on it. So you just take a supremum over all t and t of the Hausdorff metric of s of t and g of t. Um, so I wanted to, when I was reading this paper, I was look, thinking about a specific instance of a multifunction. So um, if you define uh, sigma i star to be just a map that takes a compact subset and sends it to sigma i of b, another compact subset. That's going to be a Lipschitz contraction in the delta metric. And then I want to take as my set the union of all k tuples, where the elements are just coming from gamma sub n. So they're just any length finite k tuples. And then we can define shift maps on t, which just sends a1 through ak to just put an i in front. And the map, um, 
I want to define this map on multifunction. So what, is, what does it do to a multifunction f? Well, the new multifunction u f of a is, well, sigma of the first entry of a, so sigma a1 star of f of w a1 inverse of a. And this is just a tiny modification of what Franklin had done in that, that paper where they talked about a union operator. Um, so uh, he showed that this is in fact a Lipschitz, that U is a Lipschitz contraction in the D metric. And, the, and so I, the U is so very close to what this union operator was. So it's essentially the same proof. And then so, but interestingly, so by the contraction mapping theorem, you got a unique multifunction, um, a fixed multifunction. In other words, if you work out by induction what this multifunction does is actually just the assignment which sends a1 through ak to the subset sigma a1 through sigma ak of x. So you can um, think of that as actually a, as, a, as, a lip, as a fixed point. Um, and so just a quick summary. So to summarize, for an arbitrary IFS, we've generalized the Hutchinson measure to a positive operator value measure. Um, then we've shown that this positive operator value measure can be dilated to a projection value measure. And this is an instance of Nymark's dilation theorem. And then finally, this map A1 through AK getting sent to this um, natural subset, sigma A1 through sigma AK of X, is in fact a fixed point in a metric space of multifunctions. So uh, thanks so much to the organizers, Franklin and Joseph, for the opportunity to present. I'd also like to thank Judy Packer at University of Colorado for her guidance. And then here's some relevant uh, references. So uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Anybody have any questions? So I had one. From, it, it seems uh, perhaps I, I, I missed it, but were you uh, taking sort of const the, the analog of constant probabilities, constant weightings for your uh, for your operator. Excuse me. It looks like a yeah, because it looked like you had a one over n in your in for your positive operator value. Yeah, I was doing situation. all the same. I was yeah, doing so what all would, one over n. Have you ever thought of trying to put pi's there? What would happen if you I weighted think, each of the different pieces? Yeah, I, I think it was. I think it, everything would still go through. It seems like it because yeah. putting yeah. the the uh, the adjoint there would sort of correct for that, right? You'd have a yeah. pi and you'd have the yeah. reciprocal on the other part. Yeah, that's would, a good idea. No, I, I I just wonder what the what the corresponding uh, uh, operator value uh, measure would look like. It's sort of would be doing some different kind of decomposition or something, right? You still get the conjugations yeah. and everything else. You would get, so, so. Yeah, I mean, I think for every choice of your probability vector, you would get a different, um, you know, it would sort of be weighting things differently, just like in the classical sense, but it would be done in this sort of functional analysis, which is uh, slightly um, more general. I haven't really worked that out, but yeah, I, yeah. I think it's, I think it would all pass through. Mm. Thank you for being here again.